Lord, that you have ordained this moment in time, and we thank you for all the things you've done for us. And I ask this now in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Before I, I begin, we had looked at concerning the time frame that how God through an apostle, uh, a prophet, God used him to restore to the church all the doctrines of the apostles as well as the principal doc doctrines of Jesus Christ. And last week I mentioned that the saving grace of Jesus Christ was the foremost cry, if you want to, concerning any believers from the day of Pentecost till 1963. But after that, God moved in another direction in now again revealing things here at the end time. And I mentioned that from 1963, since the doctrines of the apostle was all restored, up to, well, I don't show 217 there, but till we reached the year that we live in now, and I said it was 44 years. But actually, I was talking to a brother, he said, no, it's 54 years. Well, it's not the number of years I was trying to show. I'm just trying to show it was a long time for the bride having the doctrines of the apostles and the principal doctrines of Jesus Christ. And that's been wonderful. But God saw fit that, we, that the bride needed something more to come to her close to be, for her final role. That she would need, because it's from 1963, that God once again, like he did, and I'll just use another chart maybe, How many know that when Jesus walked on earth, the great eternal spirit gave him everything that we needed to know about salvation to being saved, how to come to him, that what he had come to do for you and I. But then when he goes, dies on the cross of Calvary and go in the lower part of the earth, he took those in the paradise part that was there and he brought them up to glory with him. Then the Spirit was sent down, the Comforter, and Jesus told them, he says, when the Comforter comes, he'll show you things to come. And so therefore, Jesus didn't reveal everything, but he was the means that would start that grace age. First of all, we see being saved by grace through the finished work of Calvary. It's so simple to you and I. Once it's been revealed, because prior to Jesus coming, even the angels couldn't figure it out. But God was saving that for his only begotten son to open that area. And so therefore, from the early church on, the Spirit of God now started dealing with the apostles like Peter, James, and the different ones, and even the apostle Paul. How that the apostle Paul was given revelations that we carry most of the epistles with. And those were things, yes, things was pointing to the future, some things was opening up some mysteries, but was mainly concerning how we should live and conduct ourselves. And there was a model church in the early church called the Ephesian church. And it, was, it came to its height when Paul was in, at Ephesus teaching at the school of Tyrannus. And can you imagine today, if we, you and I were in that condition when he was preaching at the school of Tyrannus, the reason there was no school between 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it was so hot that they didn't bother having school for the regular school. So Paul asked him if I could use that period of time. And Paul, sure, then the, uh, Tyrannus says yes, because it was his school, he says yes, you can use it. And for over three years, or three years or so, 
Paul preached some mighty truth, and people believed and walked into further truth than what the Lord had given. But it's all God's Word. And it was the model church. And truth came by the apostles. But by the time you reach 65 A.D., most of the apostles are off the scene. The last one is the Apostle John, which was given the book of Revelation. He records it. And it's yes, it points to the seven churches that was physically in Asia Minor, but God was using the type of the Spirit. It was each one of those churches to show what the church age would be like. For each one of these periods of time, the church age would represent it. But very little was known on the book of Revelation. First of all, it was only to be revealed at the time of the end. And God, and concerning it being revealed at the time of the end, even Jesus himself, when the disciple came to him, well, the Pharisees says that John didn't re the Baptist, which was had the Elijah spirit, like the same spirit that was on Brother Branham, having that Elijah spirit, well, he says John the Baptist didn't restore everything. If you read chapter 17 of Matthew, Yes, that was John the Baptist, but Elijah shall come again and restore the things that need to be restored concerning the Word of God that had not been revealed. You say that, and when God sends a man on the scene, more often than none, actually almost all the time, he's rejected by the religious world at the time. So the church took a long swing downward. Then you come to the Church of Laodicea. From 1948 coming to 1963, God used that anointing of an Old Testament prophet on a man, took all the different revelations that was in the different churches, and He restores them back to the Bride of Jesus Christ. Not to a denomination, but to the true child of God that's hungry and seeking God, that has a hunger in their heart. But then when that's all been restored, that did not reveal the hidden things and other things that was in the scripture that had never been opened up. So now the Lord deals from 1963 onward. He starts with that prophet, start revealing things that the world had not heard of or known of. First of all, the things that's in the book of Revelation could not be really opened up prior to that hour. In, not in Luther's day, not in Wesley's day, because history had to go f be on ground Record it in your history books that when the Lord used that prophet to open those six seals, he could, you could look back and you could see the history of it. Because had it not happened yet, you could no more relate it to it than what the early church had when, the, when they had the book of Revelation. Is that clear enough? But I have something this morning. And Monday morning, early in the morning, the Lord opened up something else again. This is not a subject that you can daydream and fall asleep with. Because we're living in an hour that the Lord is going to do something for this bride. Now even the two days of Hosea among the movement, not everybody's on the same page that the seven church ages is actually the two days of Hosea. Now, for you that may be new, what does it mean two days? God uses some definitions. Uh, I'll use one that's maybe familiar, you might have heard. That one day with the Lord is a thousand years, but His thousand years is a 360 day year. So days sometimes refer to not the day of 24 hours. You have to read it in its context of what it's speaking about. And you'll find in Hosea that He says, after two days, He's going to revive the Jews. That's why they're being brought in the homeland right now. And if you take 2,000 years of prophetic time from the time the Ephesian church started, now 
back in history. They have not nailed it down to the year and the month. So we won't know the, if you want to, uh, this, this, the month or the day, or the day or the hour. That's not the point. Well, the point is we have to start seeing that it's going to get closer, that where we're living at right now, the time has gone on from, let's say, I, from what I can see from the account, which is probably be 56 AD. Now, don't take that to the bank, but somewhere we have to use a reference point. As time would progress on, 2,000 years will bring you around 20, 24, 26, which is not too far down the road. That's why God brought that little nation in place here. We see it in, on the timeline. She became a nation in one day. So that's Hosea 6 and 2 is only one scripture, but you need another scripture to confirm a time frame. And when you look at the seven church ages that is in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, that mirrors exactly the same time. Because when the church age ends and when the two days of Hosea end, you are now in that 70th prophetic week. Now, for you that might have not know what prophetic week is, it was told to Daniel way back in, in Daniel chapter 9. The angel Gabriel, an archangel, he comes in when something is dynamic and important. And Daniel wanted to know what was going on. And he told Daniel the 70 prophetic weeks concerning your nation. And we know that 69 of them went till Jesus died, because when you read the scripture, as the Messiah has been cut off, then God stops the clock. And that's where I, I'd have to say to the movement this morning, what part you don't understand that the clock is stopped for Jewish time? So the two days Hosea has nothing to do with dealing with the Jews. It's us Gentiles. Because when the two days ends, it's the same time as the Gentile age ends. So God stopped the clock in the day when Jesus died on Calvary concerning how he's going to deal with the Jews. But it's got, they got dispersed in different countries of the world after that in 69 AD. As what's going to start it is when the Antichrist, the B systems, he signs a covenant, not just with Israel, but with the ten horns of Europe and the Middle East, which is the body, when he signs that covenant, God said that's when the 70th start, and not before. So just so you just a little background on so you know what the 70th weeks of Daniel is about. But now, I want to deal with something this morning. Just as a part of review leading up into this message. One day in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the disciples want to know when is going to be the old thing, when is you going to end, when's your kingdom coming? They want to know just like we want to know. But he says, of the time and the season, it's not for you to know. Now, when he said that, no, it was not for them to know, but because he said it, meant someone was going to see it one day. Otherwise, he wouldn't even have bothered mentioning it. And so times and seasons, there too, when we talk about times and seasons, it don't tell you, if I use the word time today, some people think of something like this, a watch, a clock. But times is often referred to other things besides, besides hours. It can be years, it can be decades, or it can be a number of things. But you, when the Lord brings his word and expresses a certain dimension of word, that word definition of the word times and season means, you have to look it in the terms of what is it applying to. Okay, maybe before I get to that, just go on a bit of... What is a day in God's definition? It's a cycle. One day on the earth, 
To you and I, it's 24 hours. But on Venus, it's a whole lot shorter. Because it's a cycle. That's all it's referring to. It's just, and now when Adam came on the earth, he didn't have a watch. Well, Lord, okay, a day. Uh, I got a watch here, I can measure the, the time. No, it was all he knew. He didn't have no clock, no sand things to measure. It's, it's night to day and day to night, which is a cycle. All right? Weeks. And there too, when we get into the word weeks, because that we're going to deal with the word weeks in concerning the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. And if I say that to the man on the street, oh, week, oh, that's seven days, that's seven days from now. That's how modern man has equated what the word weeks mean. But the word, the word weeks only means is a multiplier of seven. Not related to days, hours, and so forth. It's a multiplier of seven. So it can be a multiplier of days, it can be a multiplier of years, or it can be a multiplier of centuries. All right? The word times. It's a multiplier with a different, like if we were going to teach algebra today, it's with the letter X, undefined. And the only thing that defines the word time is when we relate it to something. The time of the, of the uh, solar system. You're not talking about hours and minutes and seconds. All right? Seasons. In the Bible, it refers to decades. The definition of time and season. An apostle was on the scene. And God took that scripture in Acts 1 and 7. Time and seasons meant centuries and decades. Because those apostles were looking, when are you coming, Lord? Well, he told them it's not for you to know. But here we need to know. And so therefore, time-wise, from 33 AD when Jesus told of them, to his disciples in, in the beginning of the book of Acts. As we have moved through time from 33 AD to 2048, or let's say 2000, year 2000, 2000 even, where, or the 20th century, that means there would be 20 of 100 years to go by. So, if the Lord talked about season in reference, in reference to centuries, when would those centuries end? And those centuries would end, uh, if I got it here this morning, all right, it's not on, all right, I can use just as a reference anyway. The centuries ended, and we're not going to use man's how to figure things out and how that all happens. It was so simple that last year, or the beginning of this year, the Lord dropped in the river. It was there all the time, so simple. Centuries would end by what the words Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. You won't know that. Sorry, when Israel became a nation in one day, when you see the fig tree put forth a branch and starts to putting forth leaves, watch what he says, that generation shall not pass away till everything will be fulfilled what the apostles were looking for. So a generation is not a hundred years. So when Israel became a nation in one day, there would never be another hundred years to go on that all things would come to its climax and fulfillment. We are now living in decades. And how that we look, we've seen how in Luke the 12th chapter, verse 38, when 
It talks about how the Lord would come down, well, not there, but it talks about in Thessalonians how the Lord would come down in a shout. That's a message. But then when you relate it to Luke, it's speaking about the same period of time that the Lord would come down and feed servants, not up there, there's no point up there, down here. And that would be over the space of time through Brother Branham, through Brother Jackson, and even part in this fivefold ministry. But then Jesus says another thing, like he told his disciples, it's not for you to know. There's a simple little scripture that was standing there. He says, what is it if I come in the second watch or a third watch? And right away our gentle mind always went to, oh, he's talking about the day, the watches of the day. No, he's talking about the watch of his coming. And he talks about if there's a second or a third, he didn't say that just to confuse people, the bride, that there would be three watches before he actually returns. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, we find that how that, he says, he talks about how there was the foolish virgins would come, how they went out to buy oil and so forth. I don't want to go through the whole parable. But at the end of it, verse 13, he says, watch. In another scripture, in another place, he says, pray and watch. Why does he say pray and watch? Because it's something was going to come on ground that has never been revealed before. We don't need to pray and watch for the doctrines of the apostles. We see them. But what you and I don't see, or what they didn't see in 1963, or prior to 63, they didn't know when Jesus would break those seals. Because in the book of Revelation, by understanding what God has opened up in our hour, when he breaks those seals, that's when he's coming to the earth to, re to get his bride, and not before. All right? So now as we go from 1963, that's why God changes the order now. From Now he doesn't do away with the doctrine of the apostle. We need to live right. We need to know how to act. But if we don't know how to, if we don't know it by going through 54 years, another 54 year ain't going to help you either. Well, let's be reasonable. If it go much longer, actually what happens, the reverse happens. If there's no truth, then the, that church will go downhill and take a downhill slide. That's what happened to the Ephesian church age after they'd had it for a number of years till after the Apostle John, no more fresh revelations coming, and now it starts taking a downward spiral. They didn't get rid of do the doctrine of the Apostles, but it takes fresh meat to keep a bride energized and alive. And if he says he's going to show us things to come, well, I hope to God he just didn't show it to the early church and that's all there is and we just have to play till he comes. There's things in this hour that God is revealing that he has not revealed in those days. And sometimes we have to wait till conditions and things are on ground and when he opens it up we can see it. All right. It's how to approach it. <laughs> so the first watch was under a prophet messenger that was a messenger to the lady in this last church age. He's off the scene. God brings an apostle on the scene because God was going to use a, an apostle of a stature like he did Paul and Peter and those to bring into place a five-fold ministry. You don't hear about a five-fold ministry in the church world. There's either evangelists or pastors. Right? Oh, they have evangelists too. But aside from that, they're not looking at what's in the scripture concerning Ephesians chapter 4 when Jesus speaks about these five type of ministry. It was to bring this bride to her completion 
back on the revelated Word of God, not believing several ways for Sunday, different things as different men wants to project. Because he's, he's going to bring her to a one revelation, one faith. It's, but that's why it's spoken in Isaiah. That they shall lift up the voice together. When he brings again Zion, as he's bringing natural Zion, Jerusalem in place, he's going to be bringing the bride to her Zion. All right. We are now in this third watch. Now, for the generation, since Jesus said that that generation will not pass away, he made two statements in it. He says, when you, the fig tree puts forth a bud, we know that. That was, and it was with a prophetic event, Israel became a nation one day, as he's talked about in Isaiah. The next prophetic event, he also said, when it starts to put forth leaves, that leaves are people. And the other prophetic event is when Jerusalem, no longer occupied by the Gentiles in 1967, fulfilled the words of Jesus that you're finding in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And so now that's on ground. Now when we look at the reality of it, the generation of that seen Israel become a nation in 1948, they're your World War II veterans age around, if you want to. With what we're looking at time going up the road, for everything being finished and a five-fold ministry being in operation, that generation will not be a five-fold ministry at that hour. But the generation that's seen 1967. And when we talk about a generation, we have to go back what the scripture declares, in, like in, he said in Moses, that that younger generation came in, those of 18 or 20 years older, they would go in the promised land, the old generation would not. So he's, whoever was around 18, 20 years old in 1967 would be the generation that God would use that all things was going to be fulfilled. Now from 1967 to 2017, we have gone through five decades. Psalms 90, uh, forget which verse, around seven or so, talks about that the life of a man it's three score and ten, 70 years. Or by reason of strength, it can be 80. So therefore, 80 is the maximum that you can look at a generation. So therefore, we're not looking at pinning a date that it's, it's that hour when, but we have to look at it in a realistic term. If he says that generation, he's letting us know that we're going to know the season. We won't know the day or the hour. Forget that. But we know how close we're getting. So from 1967 to 2017, five decades has gone by. You have two left. Two decades, and then that, that should be finishing here when the Lord physically comes. But from, we know that the week of Daniel is seven years of time. So seven from 20 is about in the rough 13 years that we have before our rapture is going to be transpiring. Is that, is that clear so far? Now I'm getting to the place I want to get to. As we have seen that how prior to last year or the year before, all that Brother Brown knew, all that Brother Jackson knew, that we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ for rewards, that's in heaven. But that's like the starting of the picture. Because when you bring in Luke chapter 19, verse 15, and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, then it shows there's more to that judgment seat of Christ than just everybody being in heaven. Because Luke chapter 19 verse 15 puts the Lord down here in angelic being. Not he is himself, but as the angelic being is projecting the image of Christ to the earthly recipient. During this half hour, the literal Lord Jesus Christ, the glorified Lord Jesus Christ, he's in heaven, 
He's give, metering out the rewards for the deceased bride saints. I hope that's clear. Do we need to know those things? More so than knowing that there's uh, the miracle war and the building of the temple and the Ezekiel war. Well, that's for the Jews. It gives us a time frame. But we need to know what's going on in that half hour. So the Lord has opened that up. And because when we start looking at it in realistic terms, when he starts judging those that would cut, let's say that seventh seal is broke in heaven, and, you start, and then time we're starting moving in that half hour, only the bride is going to be there knowing, and he's addressing the bride only. Everything that offends, every contrary spirit will, will not be at that place while the bride is being administered to during that half hour. So now you have a living element. He comes in, the seven seals broke. But before that angel can come, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, well, maybe I should put some things up here, I guess. I don't have it in this one here. Okay, well, I'll just do it in words. Or maybe I have it over here. No, well, I check and get it here. Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to start from the ninth verse. We know that in verse 9, Jesus will have had opened that seventh seal. And why that in 1963 he used a prophetic ministry to open six seals back then? Well, it's simple. The bride was not ready or perfected yet. She didn't have every revelation that she needed. But Revelation chapter 5 is not saying, well, this is over here, and then, then you put a yardstick in there. No, when it talks about the seal, the part was there at the start, so where he was going to start perfecting this bride by giving her a revelatory garment along with the doctrines of the apostles, that which she already had, that she would be made ready. And when she's made ready and the last predestinated seed comes in, he peels the seventh one. Now he peels the seventh one. And was back, I believe, in 2010, we dealt with the subject concerning a silence in heaven. Brother Branham never mentioned what it was, neither Brother Jackson. But it was shown to us that was revelatory silence from the seat that's in heaven. Now looking at it from here and looking back, here Jesus, picture yourself. He's opening that seventh seal. Immediately as he opens that, every one in heaven says with a loud voice, well, where's your silence? Huh? Where's your silence? He has not come yet. It says with a loud voice, you're worthy to receive power and dominion and so forth. Well, how do you know that's right there? Luke chapter 19, verse 15, it says, when he does come, he's already received that authority, and he received it in heaven after he broke the seal. And if he broke the seal, if the silence would be, you can't talk, they're shouting loud in heaven. <laughs> You're worthy to receive it. The moment he opens it. But it meant where he sat on that throne, of the Father's throne, being our mediator and high priest from that position of the throne. No longer revelation will come from there because he's no longer high priest. Now he's moving into, yes, there's the judgment seat of Christ he's going to be involved with, and then he's going to be the bridegroom, the wedding supper, and he's going to be kings of kings. 
So he's not going to be sitting on the Father's throne. And when he becomes king of king, he's not going to be sitting up there ruling the millennium. Down here in that temple in Jerusalem, it's going to be built. All right? So therefore, verse 12 is a vindication that the silence in heaven has nothing to do with voice silence. I'm sure if we were there and we see him open that seal, for a moment we'd be quiet. But then we would say, Hallelujah! <laughs> Power and glory belongs to him. Things are changing. Yeah. Glory to God. All right. Now, that happens. The seven seals broke. There's, they, with a loud voice, they tell them, you're worthy. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 15, it says, when he was returned. And I hope those that are listening knows what the word return means. He was returned to the earth. Having received already the authority for the millennium rule. And then it says, then, while he's standing on the earth, he calls those servants to be judged. Not for their salvation, but for their reward. That wise servant that was given one talent, he increased ten. And he says, because you've been a wise and faithful servant, you'll rule over ten cities. He didn't say, I'll give you more of the Holy Ghost. So it was a, it's concerning rewards, pure and simple. And, who's, and he's talking to living mortal people that has now entered that half hour silence. Second Timothy is the second scripture again that will confirm this. He is going to judge the quick and the dead. The dead is not the sinners. When the Bible uses the quick and the dead, he's referring to the people that been, has been quickened by the Spirit of God that is alive on the earth. And the dead are those that has gone on in glory where the, where the bride's at, where the throne of God is at. So if he's going to judge the quick and the dead, that's two locations. I'm trying to go as slow as I can because I, sometimes I just want to blurb it out in, in five minutes. But I realize sometimes we... Now I'm getting to the part where I'm going to be dealing with something. Early Monday morning, the thought was thrown. One hour. And I thought, well, one hour. When we deal with the word one hour, again, our, for our mind jumps because of this, the time we will live. Oh, one of these, one hour. I'm here to tell you this morning. One is, you'll, if you got reference, a Bible, that uh, electronic Bible that can bring cross-reference to what the word hour means. Yes, it can deal with the individual, and that is not dealing with long times. Like Jesus says, you couldn't even wait on one hour or praying. Or other scriptures in that light, it's on the individual, on individual person themselves, or that's deal with the picture you're looking at. But when you're dealing with a system, an empire. They don't go in 60 minutes. Now you're talking in terms of years. So when it looks, when you're reading the scripture, when it refers to an empire or something that exists, now you're talking about in terms of years, no longer 60 seconds or a short space of time within a time frame of whatever that's being dealt with. And so looking at it this morning, one hour with the beast. Well, not this one. Uh, 
All right. So it's in Revelation chapter 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which had received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. And because maybe that subject hasn't been dealt for quite a while back, either by Brother Jackson or Brother Branham, when we're talking about the beast, the scripture declares, and you'll find it in Daniel, God uses a beast to describe the characteristics of that empire. And that would be four beasts that Daniel has shown, and the last one would run till the end. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole history of, the four, of that last beast. But the beast... The head of the beast is Europe. We know that from Revelation and history. The body of the beast is your Middle East countries. Yes, there's ten horns. Now, why ten? Well, when John received it in 96 AD, there was ten ethnic nations that was kings. Not the multitude that you have now. Now, remember, that comes from there. Because John is the one, is the writer of the book of Revelation. He didn't know what a cruise missile was, and he didn't know what different nations that he broke up to. They weren't, it didn't exist. But out of those ten horned nations, yes, we got what we got today. So now the beast, it talks about We see Europe is going through a phase of change. Still going through a phase of change. We look at Europe, oh, that's the beast. I'm sorry, you're mistaken. That's only the head of the beast. And they don't have, one, uh, they don't have authority with the Antichrist yet. The body of the beast is your, your Muslim or Middle East countries. They're going through a change in turmoil too. But when the time comes, after two wars that's coming up the road, they'll be ready that that body will want to go with the head and that papal head, the Antichrist, then the horns will sign with him for how long? 20 years? Seven years that they're going to last, that the scripture says. So one hour with the beast is what? Seven years. Years. That's, I mean, that's without saying if you want to. So, that Antichrist will be when those horns, when they go into the 70th week, what starts it, because the sign in the covenant with Israel is in there. Israel is part of the, be the body of the beast, not the head. When that sign, you have seven years to go on. Not a day more, not a day less. So now as you have one hour is defined, seven years. But it is used in the relationship of a system or an event something, not as to an individual. Now I'm going to say something. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 says, there was a silence. And, and if you're listening this morning. The word A-B-O-U-T means about the space of a half hour. I can see that being about three and a half years. And some may not, I don't know if they went to school or not, or, or you have it on your computers. What does that squiggly line mean? It means approximate, about. But they don't see that. They just see the number three and a half. You're setting dates. That's what they like to say. I'm not setting dates. But we're going to prove this morning that the time frame, there's other scriptures, and this is where we have to listen carefully to show that it is true that one hour with the beast is seven years, and about that half hour is about three and a half. Why do you say that? 
because we're going to look at something from another point of view that will confirm the same thing. That war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, right? This scripture was laying there, innocent-like. And yes, we could see that, yeah, and I'll read it. And they that dwell in the cities, this is after that, that Ezekiel war is over, that God divinely intervenes before the week of Daniel starts. And they that dwell in the city of Israel shall go forth and set on fire the weapons, both shields and bucklers and arrows, and the hand stave and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. No, they're not going to be burning wooden chariots, bows and arrows. That's how the Ezekiel saw it in his day, which was even before Jesus. He had to relate it in what he saw. This is talking about weapons of warfare. They're not going to be using that in Ezekiel up ahead. Forget, they wouldn't even have a chance in today with all the modern weaponry. But it says they'll be burning the weapons. Now what kind of weapons when they come? And this is the part here. When they, they're going to be an air armada, a secret attack, sponsored by Russia. Russia is the backer. They got all their military hardware and everything else, not just to, to test Israel. They want to make sure that they make a complete strike. And Israel is well equipped. So they're going to have to have a lot of weaponry. And that's why they have the planes coming in from different directions as they come in, because it says, like a cloud, they come. Now, Ezekiel didn't say they're coming in airplanes, but if they're coming like a cloud, they're coming in the air. And God says that he will destroy them by his widowmaker, because you can bring in Job chapter 38, where he says, I reserve the hail for this time of war. This is where you're going to see it. And so that weaponry that they have in those planes is going to be, as, they, as God calls that, whatever it is that break hails and knock those aircrafts out of the air, and weapons and men are going to be strewn all over the country, wherever they're coming into to, as a point where they want to pinpoint the attack. And so therefore, it'll be seven months in burying the dead. That's, well, that's not a problem. But why mentioning burning the weapons? How they burn the weapons? Well, in the past, in the different wars Israel had since 48, she takes some of those old depleted equipment, military equipment. She'll, use, she'll uh, take the parts out of it, reuse it. What she don't use she, use, she can use the steel to melt it down and make new tanks with it, or whatever wep uh, cannons or whatever they want to make. So burning the weapons is in that position there. Now, so now that we understand that part, When do they start burning the weapons? Ten years down the road? No, immediately when they go pick up their dead body for seven months. And they're also starting to clean the land. And so they're cleaning the land. And it'll be seven years from Ezekiel 38 and 39 finishes. All right? So when that war finished, there's going to be seven years. They'll be uninterrupted by, by means, uh, by normal means, that they will run seven consecutive years, but they'll only be for seven years. And there has to be a reason why it stops at seven years, why God put that number there. The reason behind it. From the week of Daniel, uh, sorry, from Ezekiel 38 and 39, we know when it starts. 
But when we arrive to the middle of the week, when that Antichrist sits in that temple, Jewish temple, just like in days gone by in the past in history, whenever a Gentile tried to get into that temple, all those Orthodox Jews get real mad. And so therefore a war is set up as that Pope has come in and he has his, all the military mice of that whole beast empire, the head and the body, and he's going after those Jews that don't want to let him sit in there. And according to Zechariah 13 and 8, along with Isaiah 4 and 1, and now with Isaiah 3 and 25, it says, Zechariah chapter 13 says, two-thirds at that time is slaughtered. Is that a little killing? Do you think they're going to be worried about cleaning the land then? Not one bit. So the seven years ends when the Antichrist goes against those Jews. Now that being so, well, from the middle of the week coming up to the beginning of that week, you've got three and a half years. Take three and a half years from the seven, that leaves you what? About three and a half years. That makes, to me, perfect sense. So therefore, when we look at one hour with the bees is seven years, we can prove that by the scriptures. The scriptures declares it. There's a whole bunch of scriptures that you can look concerning that week of Daniel is seven years. You'll find it in Daniel chapter 7, uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. You'll find it in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, uh, and other scripture that defines the time frame. Now, some of it doesn't lock the seven. It talks about the three and a half year here. There's peace time and three and a half for this terrible time, or when the prophets are on the scene and when the destruction takes place. But irregardless, it's seven years. I mean, that's not disputed among the, among the movement. So if it's seven years, and it says about the space of half hour, I can, now that half hour is not in term of individual, it's about an event. Just like the horns on that beast have power one hour, it's about an event. So those are in terms of years. Well, you're trying to say we, now you know the hour. No, we don't know the hour or the day. Because we don't know when, when that war is finishing, when that seal is broke. Is it on day one? A month later? But we're going to know close to the year how that's going to come about. We don't know the day or the hour. But we'll know the, se the season. The season is the decade. Now getting back earlier what I was talking about, five has gone by here. We got 13 years that's easily put in and have those events fulfill itself and we being right there. I hope you haven't been daydreaming this morning. Oh, but you don't have the right to, to say what one hour is. Well, tell me who does. God does not let individual choose who the servant he wants to use. But the servant he will use will bring things forward that will open a picture not contradict anything from what was revealed in the past. Because in that half hour that the judgment seat of Christ, some are going to be dealt with on the earth, does not take away from all those that are in glory that's, that's taking place at the judgment seat of Christ. First of all, you can't put the judgment seat of Christ for reward prior to the grace age finishing. And to the naysayers, if, if you want to go contrary to this. 
How many bride saints do you think is in heaven? Half a dozen or so? Well, we know there's 12 apostles. You've had all the whole grace age for bride that has gone to glory. Let's say they're a million even. I don't know the number. It could be 10 million. But that judgment seat of Christ is not, hey, everybody's here. Everybody gets the same thing. He can do that in 10 seconds flat. But everything that's recorded concerning our reward, whether we be on the earth or in glory, is on an individual basis. And he's going to look at that individual saying, here's what you've done. And this is what's your reward, individually. And to go through a million people, you don't do that in six months. I'm sorry. That's why I can see it would take about that amount of time for Jesus to deal with the bride saints in heaven, giving them their individual rewards. Oh, my. But Brother Jackson and Brother Brown didn't say that. Are you depending on because you knew the man? Or do you have the Holy Ghost that's going to show you fresh meat? That's what we're looking at. So now that, and on top of that, I know it's, if, you, if you don't have the spirit of revelation in you, It's a wonder and a mystery to them. What does that angel doing at the end? Offering up the prayers of all the saints. Not on the earth. He's in glory before the throne. You think Jesus would be the one doing that? That angel has a major responsibility. He offers up all the prayers of those that are going to be praying, yes, in that half hour. While you're living on the earth, that's where prayer counts. You will not pray another prayer once you're in glory. Your work is finished. But I remind in Revelation chapter 5 again, verse around verse 8, that the beast were holding the bowls of prayers. The 24 elders were holding the bowls of the prayer. And if you don't know what the 24 elders of. It's a representation. Twelve of them is of the twelve patriarchs that represent Israel during the, great, during the age of the law. Twelve of them is the apostles of the New Testament. They're holding the prayers of all mankind, the beasts from the days of Adam, then from the law with the twelve patriarchs, and now with the twelve apostles are holding the prayers of the grace age. They're holding them in the bowl, and nowhere do you find where they're being offered. And the only place that I can see it being offered is by that angel here doing something very important, offering it up before the great eternal spirit. And the Lord says, well, uh, uh, just an ordinary angel will do. No. He's of a capacity. That would be of the same type as Christ would be. And the only angel that I know that, uh, that, fits that, ca that fits that description and that, uh, that place is none other but Melchizedek. He's an angelic being. Well, you say, well, no, Brother Ram said that was God in, in, the in theophany form. I beg your pardon. God allowed the prophet to say things. And he allowed dual statements to become forth. So man would have to go to the scripture to see what's true and what statement is not. And when you look at the read the scriptures in Genesis chapter 14, it says Melchizedek of the Most High God. He didn't say I'm God. And in the same verse, Abraham of the Most High God. Was Abraham God? If he's not, neither is that angel. Because it's the same terminology that's used for both. Well, Abraham's a man. Melchizedek is an angelic being. And he was, God used that angel to set a type what Jesus Christ would be like. So why would it not be that angel that would be offering all the prayers? 
And when this time closes out, when that angel does that, the trump is going to be sounding, the dead in Christ is going to rise, and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we are alive and remaining, shall be changed in a twinkling of an eye. And when we go up in the rapture, the wedding supper, the bride is his wife. He is not going to judge his wife. No more than a mortal man here try to judge your wife and see what happens. I don't have to go any further. I think you got the, you got the picture. All right? So therefore, the only place the judgment seat of Christ is happening in that half hour. Does this save you? You're saved on, the, on what Jesus did at Calvary. And that, what he's done for you and me at Calvary. It's not our goodness, it's, what, it's his righteousness. Sometimes we say, well, we should, it's good to put things off, but your righteousness depends on what he's done for you or me, and we believe that he's done it. But taking that as it be, of all the things that Christ has done for you and I, and how we should live with uh, one another, yes, in the doctrines of the apostles, there's things that was pointing to some future things, some other things that was opened up, but the majority was concerning the Christian life. And that being said, with just the principal doctrine of Jesus Christ and the apostles' doctrine, will not perfect a bride. Because the bride has to put on not just a white garment, a revelatory garment, which the Lord has been revealing ever since 1963 about things that was not opened up in the scriptures, Old Testament or New. Oh, and I don't know about you, they can say what, people can say what they want. Frankly, it's, it's not up to my hands. It's, they're in the hands of the Lord. He's the one that's going to be judging this. Because there's going to be a category, as it says in Luke chapter 12, had this man been watching, he would not have had his house suffered to be broken. In the other parable, it talks about he that knew the Lord's will but didn't do it, we're going to receive so many stripes. And he that did not know is going to receive less stripes. So there has to be in this hour people that's going to fulfill those categories. I know we like to see everybody in the bride being all revelated and at the same point. But God knows who's going to fulfill what. And we're not, I'm not saying that it's to categorize people, but knowing that's what's going on, why there is some differences. You and I can no more change someone than you can change the moon a different color. But God can. Praise the Lord. You want to hear something now on a lighter side of things? I was watching a video on YouTube concerning the atomic bomb, how that it developed over the years, and the scientists got so gung-ho. It used to be a great big monstrous thing, the first atomic weapon. Then it came smaller and smaller, until finally they could put it into a cannon. Then they showed that a man could have it on a pack set, he would leave it there, and then he'd have to walk 10, 20 miles away and then set the thing off. And then the scientists came, came and says to, to the heads of, of the government, and says, well, we can even miniaturize it enough to put it in, in a hand grenade. And the guy says, who's the nut that wanted to throw a nuclear hand grenade? <laughs> Just how silly things got. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. 
But now, more and more, as God is opening things up, he's, he's getting that picture to gel more and more of what we see in this hour. No, I, God doesn't expect you to understand every detail, but when we see the picture, it makes spiritual sense. And so therefore, the spirit that was said will show you things to come is still active today. And when you start talking about the things I'm talking about this morning, well, they expect to have a revelation every day. No, we don't. That's just naysayers and someone that has the spirit of Antichrist on them. Wow, it's a long ways from when I was 18 years old, didn't want to step in front of a class to give my book report. But you don't know what God has for you either. And may I say this, it's wonderful what God has revealed and what God is showing. But we all have a responsibility because the nine spiritual gifts that's in Corinthians is not just to the ministry, it's to the body. And I'm waiting for that too. To be expressed like it was in the early church. Not that we're going to convert the world, but what hour do we really need now some of those gifts? And when we have the gifts in our, that he's using us or whatever he's going to use you for, we're not going to run off and say, well, I oh, worked here, well, well, I got a friend here, I got a relative. You'll be like Jesus. I do nothing except the Father shows me. You're going to put a responsibility, but you have to know that you have a responsibility. And that hour is coming. Because there's going to be an hour of the miraculous arriving on the scene. When God moves divinely and miraculously with that miracle war, which is just ahead of us somewhere. God's coming on the scene as he was in the days of Moses. You'll find that in Micah. That he's going to not repeat the same things he did in Moses, but he's going to divinely come on the scene and for a, whatever a long time that man has not seen God on the scene, brother, things are going to change. And then the bride, things are going to change. And we best be ready for that hour. Oh, could preach another hour now on this stuff. But you can only absorb so much. It's not how much you can grab in one sermon. All right, let's just stand. Holy Father, I thank you, Lord, for the things you have allowed us to see. No man has any credit of any things of truth that you bring. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory belongs to him. And Lord, we ought to look towards thee and that comforter you said you would send. Now, Lord, as we go, our, as we come to this part of the service, have your way, I pray, in Christ Jesus' name I ask. Have the musicians come, and if there's a need, we'll sing maybe one number or two, and we'll go from there.
Thanks. Thanks. I give you thanks. All you have done. I am so blessed. My soul has found rest. Oh no.
Let's walk a little closer. Let us be determined. We can't thank him enough for what he's done for us. Salvation is very important. Let's just stand at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Ray to come dismiss us in a word of prayer. I just, all we can say is thank you, Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your wonderful love and mercy to us once again. Thank you for this special time in your presence. Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. Give us traveling mercies. Be with your children throughout this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.